Hello, everybody. So somebody in the Max Discord recently was asking about how to implement micro timing inside of a Max for Live sequencer that they're building. And this is one of those areas in which my opinion is that it is much easier to do when the clock that you're using is a phaser rather than a pulse train. If you're new to the channel and you don't understand what that means, I'll explain it in just a moment. Um, but what I'm going to do in this video is show you how to get that type of clock in live and then how to manipulate it in order to achieve micro timing like you might find uh, on a, an electron machine or perhaps you're just trying to implement something simple like swing. So let's get into it. So the first thing I'm going to do is grab a max MIDI effect and drop it in. And we're going to just, for this one, allow any MIDI that comes into the device to pass through. So we're just going to leave these two exactly as they are. And then the first thing that we need to do is get a source of time, basically a clock from live. And there's two kind of ways to do that. One is called plug phaser. The other one is called plug sync. I'm actually going to show you a method that uses both of these approaches. And what's incredible about them is that um, they will use the exact same patch, even though the output of these is a little bit different. Particularly this um, plug phaser object is going to give us a phaser, oops, uh, scope, <laughs> live.scope range. So this plug phaser object will give us uh, a signal. So if I start my live transport here, you can see that I have a phaser signal. So this is kind of our source of time. If you're new around here, this is something that I talk about all the time. Uh, what live is doing here is giving us a ramp for every beat according to live's uh, transport settings. If I change the BPM to, let's say like 30, something really low, you can see that those lengthened. And one thing that I very often do is I prefer to kind of work with a bar as the unit instead of a beat. So I'm going to say rate four here, which is just going to lengthen this phaser so that it's for every four beats. Now, if you're not using a standard default 4-4 time signature, then this number might be different. And you would want to ideally kind of monitor, which you can do in Max for Live, monitor the time signature that's active and update that accordingly. But I'm going to leave that out of this video. The output of this device is different. It's actually got a lot of different stuff. It gives you beats and bars and ticks. It gives you all this stuff. So we're going to talk about this later. But importantly, it does not provide us a signal. And if you've watched these videos in the past, you know that typically I work with uh, time sources that are signals, meaning they run on the audio thread within Max. And really the reasons that I like to do that are because there are some very handy objects in Max that work with signals of this type and allow us to manipulate um, the time that way. And those objects don't really exist for floats and ints. So typically we work in signals. It can also be just a little bit easier to kind of get timing accuracy when you're working with signals. However, as I'll show you, if you use gen, you can actually use the same patch that you would use for signals with floats. And so very often what I will do is kind of develop a patch uh, for signal. But then if I ever want to kind of achieve the performance benefits that I can get from living in the event domain, rather than the signal domain, because the computer has to work a little bit harder to produce, to process these events, because they're not as frequent, um, then I can use that same patch. So I'll show that at the end of the video, but for now we'll just work in the event domain. Okay, so we're going to create a gen patch here. Um, we will give it a name, micro timer. And I'm also gonna create a buffer 
and this buffer is going to basically hold. So what we want to do basically is like subdivide this clock into let's say eighth notes. We'll just have this device only be able to do eighth notes. And then we're going to want to be able to basically shift where those eighth note grid lines basically occur. We kind of want to be able to shift them in a fine tuned fashion, left or right. So what we want to do basically is perform this subdivision inside of Gen uh, with the sort of knowledge of which direction that particular subdivision should be shifted. And for that, we basically need a list of numbers, eight numbers, one for each increment or each subdivision. And the way that we're going to do that is by storing that data in a buffer and then accessing that buffer inside of Gen. So um, we're going to create a buffer and we're going to name it micro timing with three dashes. And the reason to do this is anytime you have a buffer, a send, a receive, anything that has a name in a Max for Live device, you typically want to give it these three dashes in front of the name in order to make it so that this buffer or send or receive or dictionary or whatever is um, its scope is is isolated to this device. Other devices can't see this buffer, which in this case is what we want. Uh, I also want this buffer to be eight samples long. And I'm also going to create a multi slider here, uh, which is what we're going to use to set those values for the micro timing. So the size is going to be eight. Um, by default, multi slider is going to give us a range of negative one to one, which is actually perfect. That's what we want. I'm going to just give us a number box here that allows us to change or reset everything back to zero. And I'm also going to activate bar mode here. And we'll do them as a sign display so we can see a little bit better. And then I'm going to write these values into a buffer. And I'm going to do this using a new technique uh, with the array.toBuffer object. So this is new as of 8.5, I think, max 8.5. So uh, I'll say the buffer name, and that is micro time. So this is cool because I can just pass a list in and then that list is going to get written into this buffer. If you're not on uh, max eight and you want a different way to do it, you can always do it with poke. So you can do poke micro timing and then you can do a list funnel and zeal rev like this. This would achieve the exact same thing as this. Okay, so now we have these values in the buffer and let's just look at what they are. So yeah, perfect. They're values between negative one and one. And then inside of gen, we're going to create a buffer and I'm actually gonna give this buffer the name buffer name. And the reason that I'm going to do that is because we cannot use this triple dash syntax inside of Gen. It's not going to understand that it wants that we want to look at this buffer called dash 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 micro timing. So the way that you work around this is use this additional feature of Gen, which is that it allows you to basically define a buffer inside of Gen and then assign a different buffer to that Gen buffer, which is really cool. If I had a buffer name buffer name in the parent patch here, then this buffer inside of Gen would refer to that, but I can always reassign that. And so what I'm going to do is say at buffer name micro timing. And now I'm actually referring this buffer to this one. So let's actually just test here and make sure this works. So I'm going to add a, a subdiv uh, eight. And I'm just going to pass the second uh, outlet in which is just going to give us the, uh, the index. So basically what subdivision we're on. And it should be that if I use uh, peak buffer name, 
then I should get whatever value we have. We, sh we should basically step through this list. So that looks like that's working. So now we're properly referencing that buffer. And we are going to be looking up into that buffer name, but we're going to be doing something else with that number. Okay, so um, let's start just with a basic subdivider, which is not ultimately what we're going to do, but it's helpful. So we're going to, because we're just hard coding with eight here, I'm just going to go times eight. And then I'm going to say wrap zero one. You could also in this particular case do modulus, but wrap is kind of nice because it handles negative numbers elegantly. We're not expecting to get any here, but it's just convenient. So if I send that to out two, and then I send the floor of that to, or sorry, the floor of this to out two. So this is going to be a phaser. This is going to be the index. And we are taking the output of the rate here. We just recreated basically subdiv a very simplified version of subdiv inside of our gen patch. So basically what we're doing here is scaling this by eight and then wrapping it. And you can see here that we have kind of like uh, this phaser, the slope of these lines is greater, obviously, than the slope of this one, eight times greater, in fact. So we could actually achieve the same thing in a little bit of an albeit convoluted way by doing this. We can take the delta, which is basically the slope of the input phaser. And if we go wrap 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, this is a trick from generating sound and organizing time. If you don't have that book in your patching and gen, you're insane. So just go buy it. So basically what this is going to give us is a number which is very small and represents the slope of this line. In other words, the difference between each sample and the prior one. And the wrap negative five, 0 0.5 bit uh, is very useful because it basically eliminates this part where it jumps from one down to zero because we don't really want that. We can think about this slope actually kind of as being the clock speed, right? So at whatever our sample rate is for this computer, 44,100 um, samples per second, that value is the speed of time, the speed of the clock. So if we take that and we actually multiply that by eight, then we have what the slope of the subdivided phaser should be. And then what we can do is basically just add up that very small number so that we get a ramp from zero to one. So the way that we can do that is um, by, uh, well, we could do it just like this, plus, and then we can use a history. So we can send the output of that into this history object, which uh, basically will take, it will delay by one sample. So here we're going to get this output one sample frame in the past because inside of gen, it's always important to remember, and this is something that trip, trips people up when they get started, is that when you think about this gen patch, what you are thinking about is the audio that is flowing into this gen patch getting processed every single sample. So 44,100 times a second, we are executing this patch and we're doing that here, like that matters, for example, in this case of Delta, because we're taking the current sample minus the last one. So we have this sort of memory of what the last one is so that we can subtract it from the current one. Similarly, we have this memory of what the last sample was at this output here, and then we can actually add that back to this, the input. So if you, I'm gonna make this connection here, and then if you just watch down here, you'll see that we'll get a ramp. We got a little ramp there. Of course, that ramp's just going to go up and up and up and up for a really long time. So what we want to do is uh, force it to wrap itself around between zero and one. And so that we'll, what we'll do is just add a wrap zero one 
into our path here. And you can see now that we're getting a phaser, which is going to be out of phase with this one, actually. Well, looks like it's in phase, but it might not always be. Uh, in phase meaning basically shifted left or right, you know, relative to the other subdivided phaser. But the slope is exactly the same, or the, the subdivision is the same. Okay, so now we're basically performing this subdivision in a more convoluted way. And the reason that we've done this is because now what we can do is modify, we can basically scale this slope at this point by looking up in our microtiming buffer and use that to implement our microtiming. So what we can do here is first we need to get a number. Let's actually just start with using the first value in our microtiming buffer. So um, by default, this peak object is going to assume that we're giving it the value zero at the inlet. And this job of peak is basically to look inside the buffer at some sample value. So the buffer has eight samples. It's very short in terms of seconds or milliseconds. Uh, it's just eight numbers. And by default, we're just going to be constantly looking at the first number and the object's going to be outputting whatever that value is. So if I attach a number box here to the second outlet, which I have that connected to, and then I change this multi-slider, and I'm actually gonna activate continuous mode here so you can see a little bit more easily. You can see we're, we're constantly looking up uh, that value. So we're getting value between negative one and one here and what I think I want to do is kind of scale that so that it's like uh, negative 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 because we don't want to shift. We don't want to like micro time beyond kind of half of whatever the subdivision is. So we'll say it's like 50% forward in time to 50% backward in time. Um, by the way, this is also one of these reasons why a phaser, this kind of ramp style clock is I think very useful in this type of use case, microtiming, because it's very easy to shift things forward in time. Whereas if you're working with a clock like you might find in a URX system, for example, that uses a train of pulses, you can always delay a pulse, but it's very hard to like make a pulse that hasn't happened yet happen earlier, right? So in those situations, in fact, often what you need to do is kind of just like derive a phaser from the pulse train. Um, so if you're working with a phaser to begin with, it's much more easy. Okay, so we go from negative 0.5 to 0.5, and then we're going to add uh, one to that so that we're getting 0.5 to 1.5 because of ultimately what we're going to be doing is uh, scaling or multiplying this slope. So we don't wanna multiply it by a negative number because that would give us a negative slope on this line, which is not something that we want. We basically wanna get a slope that is you know, more shallow or more steep. And in fact, I think we wanna do negative 0.5 here because we kinda of wanna flip this around, assuming that if the uh, slider is in the upward direction here, so this number is positive, we want the event to be longer, which means that we want the slope to be lower which means that we want the val the scaling value to be below one. So we'll make it negative because we're going to add one uh, to make higher values here be closer to zero or below one. So let's try that. So now you could see here, compared to the plane subdivision, we have longer ramps. If I come down here, we can make shorter ramps. So we have now micro timing, but it's only for, we only have one step here. We're only using this first one and they're all shifted by that same amount. So the next thing that we need to do is make it possible for us to actually look up each value for each step. And so the way that we're gonna do that is kind of have at the output here, a running counter that tells us which step we're currently on.
And the way that I'm going to do that is we're going to take the delta and we're going to test to see is the delta less than zero. And I'm just going to send that to the output here so that you can see what it looks like. And that's going to give us a train of pulses. So basically on that single sample where this value goes from one down to zero, we get the value of one. And we basically now just want to count uh, how many of those we get. We're just going to build another accumulator. So very similar to this, we're going to just count those pulses uh, as they go from uh, zero to seven. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So now we have that counter and I'm using a history object same as I am here in order to achieve this feedback for this accumulator, right? The thing that we have here that's making the phaser, we're calling it an accumulator. This is just the same idea, except that we're just accumulating pulses that occur r relatively infrequently. Um, and it's just adding one each time it gets one of those pulses because the value of that pulse is one. And because we've given this history object a name, we can actually access that history elsewhere in the patch. So if I actually send the, uh, the output of this plus object, plus counter, you could see that we get the exact same outlet, output here. So what that allows us to do is, because we're basically, by the way, just adding zero to counter, right? Plus is just a, this is just a kind of a handy way to be able to reference a history object. So what we can do is patch that into our peak object here, which means that we're going to be looking up whatever uh, whatever sample or whatever subdivision we're currently on. And so now if I turn all of these up, you can see we're getting long ones. If I have, you know, maybe the second half of them are super short, then we have micro timing. few other things that we might want to do here. So you notice that if I change these, we get like a kink in the line. You may want to say, hey, don't change the micro timing slope value until after, um, like until the next subdivision starts. So what we can do is actually just take this same, um, so we can say history uh, step. We'll call this like, or we'll call it subdivision, subdiv. Actually call it step, because this is a new step that we're getting. Um, and then here we can use a latch, which is basically like a sample and hold. So we're going to sample the buffer name the buffer, the micro timing value from this uh, micro timing buffer. And we will do that only when there is a new step, because basically if the value here is one, it will pass through, or if it's non-zero, basically it will pass through whatever it receives at the first inlet. Um, so that means that we'll only allow through our new value when the value at the input here is one, and it will just hold that kind of previous output for as long as it needs to until it gets a new pulse here. So now if I jiggle this around, you can see that there's no kink in any of these lines caused by the fact that we changed the slope halfway through one of them. It's always going to start the next one with the new data from this multi-slider. Let me check my notes here and make sure I didn't miss anything. I don't think I did. Let's hear it. So we can we can actually send that pulse to the output. Right here. And I'm going to then make a edge object. so that we can have a bang for each of these pulses. 
and I will send a MIDI note value of 60 using a make note object to make note. Duration is going to be 250. And then we'll use a note out. go. Just going to mute the instrument for a little bit. Okay, so the last thing that I'm going to show you here in this video is how we can take this exact patch and use it with this plug sync object, which some of you might already be using for your clock inside of live. So this output here, the third to last, gives us ticks. And I believe it is just a running count of ticks that have ever occurred. And if we divide this by four, and then we take the modulus of one, and I'm just kind of referring to my notes here. I always have a hard time remembering exactly why this is the way that it is. But it is, just believe me. If I then um, just turn this into a signal so that we can view it easily with a live scope. You can see now that we have a phaser that looks a lot like this one. It's actually not in phase with this one. And that's actually one of the reasons that plug sync is advantageous over plug phaser, which is that it, um, it will... I think this one stays better in phase with live, if I remember correctly, because this is kind of like a running count, I guess, of beats. So that's why we divided by four, because it's a running count of beats. I want a running count of bars. So I divide by four, which gives us a number that looks like this. And then we take the modulus, which is the same as the wrap that we had inside of Gen to give us kind of our current position within the bar. So now if I just, and this is, this is kind of crazy, if I just option drag this Gen here, I'm gonna take away the tilde so that it's event Gen, and then I just send into this patch if I then, again, just go SIG just to monitor the output, you can see that we are getting the exact same thing. And if I say cell one here, because this is giving us pulses, you could see that we're getting these pulses. And so now if I actually take, get rid of this, come over here, cell one over to our little make note thing, and I re-enable the instrument over in live. That's it. So now we are working entirely in the max event domain. So we're dealing with the max scheduler, we're dealing with floating point numbers, rather than with a signal. And honestly, no matter, like, whichever one you want to do is fine. Um, some people like to work with a signal because, or with floats, with max events, because basically the, the frequency of them is not as high. Like you're not getting as many numbers per second as you are with a signal. And they're kind of like, well, I don't wanna waste computer resources on 44,100 samples per second that I'm required for this whole chain. I'd rather work, you know, ticks is a low enough resolution that I can kind of do everything that I want from a sequencing standpoint with, you know, how quickly this particular number changes. In fact, if we go, we can, we can find out. So if I do TB here, and then I use timer. One point three milliseconds. Uh, between each of these 
if numbers coming out of plug sync here, that's plenty fast enough for you to be able to do very accurate timing in your music. So if you care about that performance, um, you can use this approach and it works just as well as using signals, assuming you are writing your, your patches in gen. And that's kind of the downside of this particular approach is that if you wanted to like use the subdiv object or what, or any one of these uh, objects that are really useful for working with phasers for timing purposes in the signal domain, you wouldn't have those available to you. So you'd have to kind of write your own in gen. Um, but it's a good reason to get into gen. Um, let's just finish up making this into an actual device. So I'm going to add this to presentation. I'm going to add this as well. Um, I think that's all we're going to do for right now. Obviously, there's a lot that you may want to customize here. You obviously would want to be able to change the, the pitch and the things like the velocity. Um, you could also, we're not going to do this here either, but like you could have this be a device that rather than generating MIDI notes actually uh, changes the timing of your incoming MIDI notes. So you can almost think of it like a quantizer that actually quantizes to a sort of micro-timed grid, which is kind of cool. So maybe I'll make a quantizer video at some point where I could show you how using just the basic, you know, fixed grid, you could quantize incoming MIDI. Um, and then once you've done that, it's easy to just layer on top basically exactly this patch and get uh, a micro-timed quantizer, which is pretty cool. So if I go to presentation and I stick this over here and I go open a presentation and I would save this, then I have a Max for Life device. I will post the patch as always in the link to the patch in the video description down below. Um, if you have any questions, put those in the YouTube comments or join the Discord and ask them there. I will see you online. Thanks. Bye.